right. I want to uh, thank you guys for the opportunity to do this tonight. And we're going to uh, look at the gospel, but uh, I want to look at it from a, more of a personalized angle. Um, many of uh, many of you that know me know that uh, I spent most of my life uh, not adhering to any any uh, practice of beliefs or truths. Uh, that I spent most of that time doing exactly what I wanted. Um, you know, everything in my life was based on self, um, pleasing myself, even even at the uh, even at the risk of hurting those that love me the most. And uh, you know, in that time, um, my what little thought structure or or ideas that I did have about God. Um, we're basically that, uh, you know, the, and, and I think it's a, a common thought in, cult, in our cultural society today that uh, that God's loving, and that you know we all do things that are wrong, but because He's so loving, you know, how could there be any form of punishment? Um, and I think those are common questions we we hear in society today. Well, God's all loving, right? And if He's all loving, how could He punish us? Uh, much less, how could there? be an actual hell, a place of, you know, quote unquote flames, eternal punishment. Um, and I think that uh, over the last two years, I've really uh, looked for truth in my life. Um, after spending the first 30, you know, running from it, I guess, if you will. And uh, uh, I found the gospel, and I think that to understand the gospel, we need to really seek uh, the nature of God. Um, and uh, his word tells us that he's holy, that he's righteous, and that he is loving, which is uh, the basic idea you hear when talking to people about God these days. Um, and I've found that the answers, all the answers I've looked for um, looking into these attributes of God have been found in his word. And we're fortunate enough that God himself gave us this. Um, one of the most telling descriptions I've found is in Exodus 34. I know some of us were talking about it uh, last week. Um, it's in uh, verses 6 and 7, and this is God speaking to Moses. And he says, The Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. He tells us that he's loving, that he's kind. Uh, he also mentions that he is the truth in there, uh, that his standard of truth is the truth. And that's, that's um, the loving part is what I think is what society grabs onto. And uh, my experience has been how I used to respond to that was with something like, well, the loving part is true, but my God would never, would never uh, send me to a place of punishment or to a place of torment. Um, and we're going to come back to that in just a second. But uh, right after that, he tells us that he will forgive sins, but that he will not clear the guilty. Uh, and these two statements almost seem to contradict themselves. Um, it's almost like we're not able to separate the punishment from the love, as though those two things aren't compatible. So uh, I'm going to set this aside for a minute, and um, I want to mention the gospel again, because, again, to get to the gospel, we need to see the reason for hell. We need to see the reason for punishment. If there is no hell then why does there have to be the cross? Um, so who is God and why do his attributes, his very being, show their reason for this? When we live in an age of questions like the one I asked earlier, I think what happens is we put our own presuppositions on these attributes. And uh, right after that, what we do is we place the attributes of love and of forgiveness above those of righteousness and holiness. And in doing that, we kind of cancel out the ones that we feel are less important. 
uh, we're so busy judging God, we don't leave any room for him to judge us by saying that, you know, my God would never judge me at the same time we're, we're judging him. And we fail to see in those moments that in his perfection, in his perfect love, you know, in that flawless righteousness, he cannot fail but to judge us. It's exactly what he says in the passage. I will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Um, so when we set out to follow that standard of truth, that standard of righteousness, um, you know, out of that is holiness comes uh, to be the standard of truth by which we are all judged and by which we are all loved. Uh, I myself was so much more willing to have the love than the judgment, you know? Um, and, and what ended up happening was I would say that, well, my God, this, or the God that I know wouldn't do that. What I'm really doing is uh, creating a God or taking partial of this God. And, and, and at the same time, um, I am serving I'm creating this God that's going to serve my needs or that's going to work around my uh, uh, negative attributes, but at the same time, I'm not willing even for a second to be open to the idea of serving His, you know? The Almighty Creator, I'm not even willing to one for one second humble myself and seek to serve His needs. Um, and it's a very, it's a very interesting paradox that I find when I'm talking to anybody these days. Um, uh, you ask anybody, they think that they're a good person, and I've yet personally to find someone that says no, or, or, or if they do, it's in a joking manner. You know, no, I'm not good. I'm going to go to hell and drink beers with my buddy. You know, and again, we don't see the attributes of God in that at all. So. Coming back to uh, God's standard here, um, this idea that I've been talking about my feelings and how I've kind of uh, taken pieces and left pieces, I found a, a great um, uh, piece of scripture out of Romans 2 that, that describes it to the T. And it says, uh, this is Romans 2 verses 4 and 5, it says, uh, you presume on the riches of his kindness and the forbearance and patience not knowing that his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your hard and pertinent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. It's exactly how I felt my whole life. He's loving, he's loving, he's loving. And I'm, I'm counting on God's love to counterweigh his righteousness. You know, when, I come, when it comes right down to it, that's really what I'm looking for. Um, so he says he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. What does that mean? I went to scripture to find the answer to that. I got a couple of quick verses I'm just going to quote here. James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. So I'm guilty if I, if I break God's law. Uh, Matthew 5.48, this is Jesus speaking. He says, You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So, what does guilty mean? It's, it's either of those things, which I have never met anybody who hasn't been guilty of one of those two things. Um, we also see in Deuteronomy 6, and then Jesus repeats this in three of the four Gospels. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And Jesus adds strength, I believe is the one he adds. And uh, when, I, when I really stopped and thought about that, I realized that uh, even though I am on a path where I'm seeking God and I love God, I've never even for one second completed this um, commandment thoroughly. Not for one second have I ever loved him the way he deserves. No matter how hard I've tried, no matter how good I've tried to be, no matter how perfect I've tried to be. And, you know, when you, ref when you turn that back to that verse I just read in Matthew, where Jesus says you must be perfect as your Father in heaven is, you know, because he's never not loved us the way that the way that his righteousness demands even for one second. Um, <coughs> so just in seeing that I've never properly returned his love, 
I see where I'm guilty of what he said to Moses in Exodus. I see that uh, I see that um, that I do deserve a judgment or a punishment. Um, and, and it's not until you really seek and understand the righteousness of God and the true nature of reality uh, in proportion to our totally uh, you know, misconceived thinking and judgment that we see our absolutely absolute need for his love and then we start to see what that truly is. And what that truly is, is the gospel message. So he tells us that he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And he tells us that he will forgive sin and iniquity and transgression. So how do the two coincide? And what happens is the cross, the cross of Christ. And um, Colossians 2.9 says, for in him, talking about Jesus, the fullness of deity dwells bodily. God came to the earth in human form. And that's where the cross takes place. I've heard it taught many different ways. I've heard it taught that um, Jesus was paying a fine to Satan. I've heard it taught that uh, because of the shame he felt being beaten and tortured, and, and murdered that day, that, that because of the pain that he actually felt, you know, is what does the work. Um, and, and, and it never quite clicked, you know, and this is after studying it for a year or so. And so, you know, if you're like me, I say, show me in the scriptures. Show me in the scriptures what happened on that cross. And um, what happens is it's God's love finding a way to fulfill his righteous standard um, that still gives us the t chance to taste that righteousness that we never could have tasted on our own, not even for a second. And Jesus fills the full wrath of God on that cross. Um, and it, and it's most simplistic, I've heard it described as a legal <coughs> transaction. That Jesus was literally paying the fine. And what the scripture shows us is that God the Father pours out that perfect vengeance on God the Son. Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sor sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Uh, 53, 6 says, The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all of us. Um, and then uh, verse 10 says, It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. What, what I see there in the Old Testament, the prophecy long before Jesus ever walked the earth, is that in the love of God, he was looking for a way. Uh, or he, he found a way to, in that perfect love, give us a chance out of it. Um, it's wrapped up real well in Romans 3. Um, this is verses 20, starts at verse 21. It says, The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, all the law, the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by the grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier for one who has faith in Jesus. That's a lot to take in, but what it says is that God is righteous, that he is loving, and that when both of those coincide, what you have is the gospel. That, that he came to earth to suffer and die in our place. Uh, and, and it's as simple as belief, faith, and coming to know him, going to work for him, and, and, and seeking to uh, you know, fulfill that uh, obligation that we have once we've, 
once we've been justified by him. Um, what I see is that we weren't saved from sin or from Satan because they weren't after us, but what we were was saved from God, from his righteousness. And the interesting thing is that we were saved from God by God because God is our loving. Uh, I want to thank you guys again for the opportunity to do this tonight. And uh, I want to close a prayer real quick if we can. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are righteous. I thank you that you are holy. I thank you that in your forbearance, in your understanding of all, that you have felt the need to give us the grace that we don't deserve. That in your perfect love for us, you have overlooked our absolute utter disdain for you. I pray for help, I pray for guidance, and I pray for strength to understand this. And I pray for salvation for many, God. I, I ask that you open the hearts and minds of, of those of us that hear this gospel message, and that you lead us to salvation, God, and that you lead us to want to do your will for the rest of our lives, seeking to serve you rather than to serve ourselves. With all my heart and soul, I thank you, God, for the freedom I found today and for the truth that you've shown me. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.